Thank you for joining us for the Synology 2022 workshop. I'm Dave Russ, a Senior Technical Account Manager here at Synology, located in our Bellevue office. Now, there are tons of great reasons to go with Synology. At our core, Synology's goal is to make it as easy as possible for you to manage and protect your data. We have over 20 years of experience in the data storage industry, and Synology has enabled businesses both large and small to bridge the gap between their business and the IT infrastructure they need to put themselves ahead. With the continued development of our hardware, software, and cloud offerings, Synology has helped to facilitate growth across all industry verticals, wherever access is needed, and at the scale required to accommodate current and emerging expectations about data management and utilization. Beyond the technical expertise of our hardware and software teams lies the entire Synology community. We really appreciate the community's feature requests and bounty program submissions because those are truly core components of our development process. If you stay up to date with our software releases, you could even see a feature implemented that you specifically asked for. By focusing on key areas such as performance, reliability, and scalability, Synology and the community are consistently refining the framework needed to accomplish this core mission. At the heart of all of this is DSM-7, which is the latest operating system for all Synology NAS devices and will continue to be the future of Synology network attached storage for many years to come. Our focus on performance, reliability, and scalability were built into DSM-7 from the beginning of its development. With DSM-7, you'll see much faster SMB searches, apps will load up to 50% faster, and our RAID 6 performance was also greatly increased. Now we've got a ton to show you today. First, we're gonna focus on two customer stories highlighting how our software can be used to solve everyday IT problems. I'll talk about how a school district used our active backup suite, surveillance station, and cloud sync software. Then I'll talk about how a software company used our virtual machine manager, active backup for business, and snapshot replication to safeguard their data. Then in part two, my colleague Cody will show you how you can pair your Synology device with our new cloud offerings to provide you with the best of both worlds. Lastly, Cody will talk about our partner network and the benefits of working with a Synology partner. Let's get into our first customer story. Mason Consolidated Schools is a school district in Michigan, and there were a lot of issues that Mason schools were looking to resolve with a Synology device. From Microsoft 365 and Google Workspace data that was not backed up, to an expensive surveillance solution with continuous costs, as well as the need to sync data back and forth between the Synology and a cloud provider. All of this while maintaining FERPA compliance, providing remote access in a safe way that meets regulation requirements. This school had a diverse workload, with over 1,300 students, four buildings to cover with surveillance, as well as 400 PCs and 700 Chromebooks to sync with the cloud. And they were able to fill all of their needs with an 8-bay Synology device, the DS1821+. Since this school had a ton of data syncing to both Microsoft 365 and Google Workspace, they realized that they needed a reliable way to back up that information. To quote the technology director at Mason Consolidated Schools, with the active backup suite, we were able to protect cloud data and satisfy educational data retention guidelines at the same time. Let me show you how you could back up your own data in a similar way. All right, so here we are in Disk Station Manager and I'm gonna click on the package Active Backup from Microsoft 365. As it opens up, we can see an overview screen showing the services that we're backing up for a specific number of users. In the top middle, we have a backup calendar, which will show us at a glance if there are any warnings or failed backups that we need to review. In the middle of the screen, we can see the amount of data each M365 service is taking up on the Synology device. And on the right, we can see how much data each of our users is taking up. So I'm gonna move into the task list tab. And as you can see, I've already created a task, but if we wanted to make a new task, we just click create, create a new backup task. Next. And we've got a link here to a great tutorial which will guide you through the process of getting your M365 environment ready to be backed up from. Let me show you the types of options you'll have once you get your task set up. So I'll click on my task and go to edit. 
and I'll move to the Users tab. And as you can see, we can choose to back up data from each of our services and users by checking these boxes as appropriate. The same idea is true for groups. For instance, we could set up a group for students, teachers, other faculty, and IT staff so we can customize the data that's being backed up from M365 to the Synology device for each of those groups. We can also back up SharePoint site data by simply checking the sites that we want to back up. Now, our auto discovery service is a fantastic tool. This service will automatically check for newly created users, groups, or SharePoint sites and back up that data as desired. This is a huge time save as you won't need to manually add those objects to your backup task as you expand your business and your M365 deployment. Lastly, within the policy tab, you have options for continuous backup, manual backup, and scheduled backup. The continuous backup option is unique because it allows M365 to update the Synology backup throughout the day whenever a file is changed. We can also choose to preserve all versions of our backup or keep a specific number of days of historical versions. Now that we've got our backup task set up, let me show you how to restore items when you need to. I'll go ahead and open up our active backup for M365 portal. Now I'm gonna search for Jon Snow, and as you can see, we load up into our OneDrive backup. At the bottom of the screen, we can see a timeline of the backups for OneDrive. I'll move to the top right corner of the screen and select Services, and switch over to Mail. Now John told me he had an email related to a wolf that he couldn't find, so I'll go ahead and search for wolf. Now when I open up this email, you'll notice that the word wolf is not written anywhere in the subject or body. The reason we still found the email is because our software searches through attachments to find keywords, allowing you to easily find and restore files. So now that we've found this email, we can choose to click Restore, which will restore the file directly to M365, or Export, which will allow us to download the file to our local device instead. Now, not only is this software extremely valuable and easy to use, it's also license-free, regardless of how many users you need to back up. The next problem Mason Schools needed to resolve was their surveillance deployment. Synology's Surveillance Station is an expandable video management system. It's highly customizable, allowing you to set up different zones, triggers, and notifications when certain events happen. You can also centrally manage Surveillance Station from a single pane of glass if you have multiple locations to cover. You also avoid subscription fees, proprietary camera requirements, and the need for additional hardware. Let me jump in and show you how this school used a couple of these features in Surveillance Station. Here we are in the Surveillance Station client, and the first thing I want to do is show you what an EMAP is. EMAPs allow you to upload a diagram of the area that you are covering with your cameras. This allows security guards or administrators to view cameras in specific locations in an intuitive way. I've already uploaded this image, and I can simply drag cameras to the diagram, and then I can rotate them by double-clicking. If we open Live View, we can see our default layout showing four cameras. I want to create a new layout with my EMAP, so I'll go into Layouts Management, and then I will click the plus sign to create a new layout. I'll call it School Layout, add my EMAP to the layout, but I'll also show how EMAPs can be used in one of our channels. I'll add our three cameras, and then I will click Save. Now back in Live View, I will select the layout that we created. As you can see in the top left channel, I can click on each camera in the EMAP to highlight that camera in the Live View. I can also double click on a camera to open a full screen view. Now if you want to just have cameras only that are showing in the layout, you can click on this button on the left to show the EMAP instead, and it will function in the same way. Now I want to show you how you can set up notifications when certain events happen, and even during particular time windows. For instance, let's imagine that the principal of the school wants to get a notification email if there's motion detected in the school after the cleaning crew leaves for the night. Let's open up the notification app. As you can see, we can check enable email notifications, add our email address, and choose the service provider. By default, 
an event snapshot will be taken and included in the email so the principal can see what caused the motion. You can also set these notifications up as SMS messages or push notifications. If we go into the Rules tab, we can choose to enable or disable notifications for different types of events. Since we want notifications to occur only during specific times, I will choose Edit Schedule and Edit Batch since I'm selecting multiple cameras. I'll choose Motion Detected as the event type, click Next, and then I will select the cameras, and then I will click Next once more. Finally, I'll choose the time frame in which I want to have the notifications occur, and then I'll click Finish. And just that easily, we can set up an EMAP and notifications for our surveillance deployment. Now we've got a ton more features in Surveillance Station that I won't have time to cover today. I'd highly recommend checking out our Synology Partner Online trainings on our website if you want to learn more about these. Next, I want to show you how Mason schools use CloudSync to automatically update their curriculum between the Synology device and their cloud provider. All right, so here we are back in DSM, and I'm going to click on CloudSync. As you can see, I already have a task created called MCS Curriculum. If we wanted to create a new task, we'd click the plus sign in the top left, and we can choose from all of these different cloud providers. I'll go ahead and click on Task List, and we can see the local path to the curriculum data. If I select that and then click Edit, I'll first note that we could have enabled encryption. I'm keeping things simple for this demo though, so I do have that disabled. We have bi-directional sync enabled, so that changes made either locally or in the cloud will be synced in the other direction. You can also choose to only download data from the cloud or upload data to the cloud if you only want editing to take place on one platform. In the Folder tab, we can choose to exclude folders from our sync if we do need to. We can move on to the Schedule tab, which allows us to turn off syncing during specific timeframes. For instance, I can remove Saturday and Sunday if no one is working on the weekends. In the Settings tab, we can change the name for the connection or adjust the polling period, which is how often CloudSync will check for changes. Moving back to the Task List, Let's open up the local folder. As you can see, within the curriculum folder, we do have two subfolders, one for Mr. Smith's lessons and one for Ms. Miller's lessons. If I create a new folder locally for Mr. Johnson's lessons, and then I go ahead and switch tabs to my Google Shared Drive, you can see that the folder is very quickly synced up to the cloud. I can do the same thing in the other direction as well. For instance, if I create a folder for Ms. Ford's lessons, and then I switch back over to the Synology device, in the top right corner, I will get a notification that the folder was downloaded, and if I refresh, I will see the folder has already synced to the local device. This software is extremely intuitive, and it allows you to not even have to think about where you're modifying your data. It'll just simply sync between the cloud and your Synology device for easy access from anywhere. The next request from Mason Schools was the ability to connect to the device remotely. Quick Connect makes this trivial. Let's imagine you're on a PC and you want to connect to the Synology device from outside of the network. With Quick Connect, your computer contacts the Quick Connect server, which then finds the Synology device. Then the Quick Connect server provides information to both sides, allowing them to directly connect, creating a virtual tunnel. This allows for easy and secure remote access wherever you have an internet connection. Once again, all of this functionality was in a single 8-bay desktop device. Let's go over all of the things this device was able to accomplish. With our Active Backup Suite, they were able to back up their cloud data. With Surveillance Station, they were able to replace their existing solution with a more cost-effective one. And with CloudSync, they were able to sync curriculum data between their Synology device and their cloud provider. And Quick Connect provided the cherry on top to allow remote access and management of all of these packages. Let's jump into our second customer story, Investor Tools. In the first customer story, we talked about a school deployment that exemplified core features that could benefit any business. Now, I want to take a look at a more advanced business deployment and dive into some key features for virtual storage, backup, and disaster recovery. 
Investor Tools is a software company that creates software for financial institutions and major banks, so they take the management of their data extremely seriously. Investor Tools needed a centralized solution for storage, backup, and restoration, and they needed it to be less expensive than their existing solution. To start things off, Investor Tools purchased a 5-bay Plus series device, the DS1019 Plus. This was a great way to get familiar with the Synology platform and test things out to make sure that they'd work as they expected before they moved up to a larger scale. They were surprised to see that features as advanced as our virtual machine manager, our own lightweight hypervisor, were available even on an entry-level device. Once the IT team was familiar with DSM and Synology, they adopted the solution company-wide rather than just supporting the IT department. For their IT leadership team in Colorado and Illinois, each location got a Synology RS1619XS+, Plus, which is a powerful business class NAS with a small 1U chassis. Let's take a deeper dive into how Investor Tools used our virtual machine manager. This software allowed the RS1619XS Plus devices to function as secondary domain controllers without occupying additional compute resources on their main virtualization hosts. All of this while remaining license-free at the hypervisor level. Let me show you what it would look like to set up a virtual machine in this way. Here we are back in DSM, and I'll click on Virtual Machine Manager. I'll go into the Virtual Machine tab and click Create to start the VM creation process. We're going to create a Microsoft Windows VM. I'll click Next, and then choose the storage pool that I want to use. I'll click Next once more, and then we'll give our VM a name. We'll call it Domain Controller. Here we can also choose the processing power and the amount of RAM that we want to provide to this VM. I'll click Next, and then enter the amount of space that I want to allocate. We'll go with 40 gigabytes. Now I've already created a virtual switch to use, so I will click Next. And then I preloaded Windows Server 2016 onto the Synology device, so I'll choose that image to boot from. The additional image is our Synology Guest Tools, which is useful when setting up Windows VMs. I'll now provide myself with permissions to the VM. And then lastly, I will see a summary of the settings that I've chosen. I'll check this box to power on the virtual machine after it's created, and then I'll click Done. Now shortly, we will see the VM being created within our list of VMs, and very quickly the VM will prepare itself and then start booting up. Once the VM shows us the running status, I'll go ahead and select the VM and click Connect. And after a few moments, it's already loading the operating system. Now this is just a simple, single virtual machine. If we had some of our core infrastructure running within VMM, we might want to consider setting up a cluster of Synology devices to provide high availability and failover between them in case it was ever needed. I'd recommend checking out our VMM Pro offering if you'd be interested in investigating that further. Moving on to the Protection tab, we can set our virtual machines up with snapshot versioning and replication. If I click List All Virtual Machines in the top right, we can see the domain controller that we just created. I'll click Create to start making a protection plan. As you can see, I can choose to create a local snapshot or local snapshots with remote replication. For simplicity's sake, I'm going to just set up a local snapshot for today. I'll select just our domain controller to add to this plan. And in the next menu, we can choose daily, hourly, or weekly snapshot schedules, or we can even create a customized schedule that we want to use. I'll select daily in this case. Next, we can choose our retention policy. I'll choose one day RPO, so we can jump back to the previous day if anything were to go wrong. Once again, I get the option to review my choices and then click on Done. And just that quickly, we've created a new domain controller virtual machine and set up a protection plan to prevent all sorts of disaster scenarios from disrupting our business. VMM is a great way to set up simple VMs without needing to pay for a large host or hypervisor. Investor Tools further their deployment by integrating the FS6400, our flagship all-flash NAS. This allowed them to centralize virtualization storage for both VMware and Hyper-V into one easy-to-use location. Investor Tools was also able to leverage the extra horsepower in the FS6400 to provide data center level backups for their cloud resources and virtual machines. 
In case of an issue at their off-site facility, Investor Tools also utilized Synology's Snapshot Replication Package. This provided retention and failover support for those backups. Synology is also capable of serving as a storage node in your virtualization infrastructure. Since Investor Tools is utilizing an FS6400, they're able to leverage this all-flash array to service multiple hypervisors from different vendors while at the same time using other backup packages available within BSM. Let's dive into how easy it is to create your own iSCSI LUN in SAN Manager. Okay, so we're back in DSM and I'm going to open up SAN Manager. We'll go into the iSCSI tab to create our iSCSI target. I'll title the target and then click Next. And now I'll create a LUN to link the target to. I'll give it a title and set the capacity to 50 gigabytes. We can choose thick provisioning to carve out all of that 50 gigabytes now or thin provisioning to reserve that much space, but only use it once it actually has data in there. I'll go with a thin provisioned LUN in this case. Everything looks good, so I'll click Done. Now that we've created our iSCSI target and LUN, I can expand the target and copy the IQN to use in our hypervisor. Now that we've got our storage carved out in the Synology, I'll switch over to a VMware environment where we want to create a new data store pointing to the Synology device. I'll quickly add a static target, pop in the IP address of our Synology device, and then save. Then we'll go to Devices and New Data Store, and as you can see, the storage is already available for use in our hypervisor. I'll go ahead and click through and finish the creation. Now with our data store set up, we can create a new VM. I've got one already created because I did preload Windows onto another iSCSI LUN, but I'll still go through the process to create one for you now. First, we'll name our VM and select Windows Server 2016 or later. Then we'll go ahead and choose our data store. We will allocate space for the VM, and I'm going to set the CD DVD drive to be our Windows Server 2016 image that I preloaded into the workshop data store. I'll click Next and Finish, and there we are. Now if I open up the VM I created previously, you can see that the hard disk being used is pointing directly to the Synology device. This is a super quick and inexpensive way to get a ton of storage space for your VMs without paying a premium for storage directly on your host. To fix their previously scattered backups, Investor Tools used the entire Active Backup suite. Active Backup for Business was utilized to handle virtual machines, PCs, and physical servers company-wide. At the data center, the FS6400 backed up all of their cloud assets using Active Backup for M365 and Active Backup for Google Workspace. Most large businesses today utilize a mix of cloud solutions while having on-prem assets at the same time. So having access to this entire suite empowered Investor Tools to house all of their backups under one easy-to-use ecosystem. Let's see how this works. Okay, so we're back in DSM, and I'm going to open up Active Backup for Business. In our Overview tab, we can see all of the PCs, physical servers, and virtual machines that we're backing up. In the top middle, we can see a backup calendar showing the status of the last month's backups. In this case, we can see red backups, meaning that at least one of them has failed and needs our attention. And in the middle of the screen, we can see the amount of data that we're backing up, as well as the amount of data after duplication and compression. In the PC and the physical server tab, we can see the devices that we're backing up using an agent, and in our virtual machine tab, we're connected to our VMware hypervisor. If I want to connect it to a new host, I can click Manage Hypervisor, Add, and then we can enter the IP address, username, and password. Now I already have my workshop VM backed up, as you can see by the green check mark, but I'll still show you how to create a new backup task. I'll click Create Task, we'll go ahead and give it a name, and then I will select the VMs that I want to back up. Next, I'll choose the shared folder that I want to back this data up to. As you can see, we do have the ability to enable compression and encryption, but I'm going to continue without those features for simplicity's sake. We can enable application-aware backups, data transfer compression and encryption, and one of my favorite features is our backup verification. Enabling this means that after every backup is completed, our device boots up a virtual instance of the backup image, 
and then confirms that there are no issues present. If any issues do come up during that process, you'll get a notification telling you that the backup failed. Next, we have a quick check to make sure that necessary services are correctly configured on the VM. And in the next section, we can choose how often we want our backup to run. I'll choose a daily backup to start at 3 a.m. Now we can choose our retention period. I'll just keep that to the latest 10 versions, but you can customize as much as you'd like. Now I'll choose who gets uh, permissions to restore the backup. I'll note here that we can choose either local users or we can choose from domain users. Our devices can join your domain and use all of the same users and groups that you're already managing. Once again, we can confirm our settings and click Done. As I mentioned previously, I already have a task created for our workshop VM on our hypervisor, so let's imagine that one day, one of our VMs is accidentally deleted. And if we don't have a backup of that VM, we are out of luck. It's just gone. Luckily, we did back it up. So back in the Synology device, if I refresh the hypervisors, we can see that the workshop VM is no longer found in the hypervisor. But since we've got our backups, we can just choose the most recent version of those backups, click Next, and now we've got the options to restore back to VMware, restore to a Hyper-V host if we have one available, or we can instant restore directly to the Synology device. In this example, let's imagine we're just going to restore directly back to VMware. Now we have the option of either instantly restoring or doing a full VM restore. Instant restore is great for when it's 11 a.m. and everyone needs to get back to work right now. Whereas full restore is best for when you have the time to allow all of the data to transfer from the Synology device back to the host. A full restore will ultimately give you the best performance, but instant restore is, as its name suggests, fast. In this case, let's go for an instant restore. We have the option to restore the VM to the original location and essentially act like nothing ever happened. In some cases, we might want to restore to a new location or host or change some settings around. In our case though, I do want to restore to the original location. We'll review our settings and I'll select Power on VM automatically after restoration and then click Done. As you can see, Active Backup is already starting the instant restore. Now I'll quickly switch tabs to show you the VM being registered in VMware. And a moment later, the restored VM appears. Now I chose for the VM to automatically boot after restoration, so I'll just give it a moment, and then I'll click into the console to show you the Windows icon, which tells you that it's booting into the operating system. At this point, we've averted a crisis. Now imagine it's 7 p.m. on the same day that we completed that instant restore. We want to get everything back to full performance before everyone comes back into work for the next day, so we want to migrate the data. To do this, I'll switch back over to our Synology device. We can simply click the Migrate VM button, and our software will work with VMware to take care of that process. I will note that migrating the VM in this way does require a VMware vMotion license. As you can see, Active Backup for Business is an important tool to have in your arsenal. Just like Active Backup for Microsoft 365 and Google Workspace, Active Backup for Business is free, no matter how many PCs, physical servers, or virtual machines you need to back up. Lastly, with snapshot replication, regardless of what happens to an off-site location, there will be near instantaneous failover options to the other investor tools offices in Colorado and Illinois. This will allow them to spin up devices either on the NAS in Virtual Machine Manager, or into other hypervisors at those locations. Now let me show you what an example failover might look like. We are back in DSM for the last time, and I'm going to show you how to take snapshots, replicate them to an off-site device, fail over to that device and make use of the data, and then reprotect and switch over to bring things back to normal. Let's start off by jumping into snapshot replication. In the Snapshots tab, I can choose a shared folder and then click Settings and set up a snapshot schedule. I can also choose the retention settings for our snapshots here as well. In the Replication tab, I've already set up replication of our Active Backup for Business Dash 1 folder to another device. If we wanted to create a new replication task, we would just click Create, Start, 
choose remote, and then type in the IP address, username, and password of the destination device. Afterwards, we would choose how frequently we want to replicate that data. Since we've already replicated data to our offsite device, I'll go into the Recovery tab. If I choose the Shared Folder and click Action, I see the option to switch over, causing the roles of each device to swap. In other words, our current source server would become the destination, and vice versa. We also have the option to test failover to our destination device to make sure we wouldn't have any issues in the event of a disaster at our main location. I'm going to go into a second tab where I have the destination server open so I can show you what a failover would look like. In the recovery tab of snapshot replication on this device, we can see that it shows replicated from. When we click on action, another option shows up, force failover. The normal failover option is not available because there are no issues detected with the source device, so there should be no need to actually fail over. I'll use the force failover option to show you how the process would work during a disaster. We just need to select the snapshot version to fail over with and then click force failover. The shared folder immediately starts the failover process and after a moment we'll show the failover to this server status. Now imagine we had virtual machines running on our source server and we needed to get those back up and running on our disaster recovery server. I'll open up Active Backup for Business and navigate to one of our virtual machines. If I click Restore, I get a message telling me that there's no version available to restore. In order to resolve this, I need to go into Storage and relink the shared folder that we failed over. Once the folder is relinked, we can go back into the Virtual Machine tab, click Restore, and now we can choose from the backup versions available. I'll choose the most recent version. Now let's also imagine that the VM host that we were using is offline. And we'll just go ahead and instantly spin up our virtual machine directly on the Synology device using our virtual machine manager. I'll just go ahead and breeze through these options since you've already watched me create a virtual machine earlier in this presentation. And we don't need to select an ISO file for boot up since we're using the backup task image. And again, I'll power on the virtual machine after creation. You'll notice that the VM says importing this time, as it's not just creating a VM, it's importing the data from our backup. Then, after a bit of preparing, the VM will boot up. After we give it a moment, we can connect to the VM and see the Windows login screen. Let's imagine that after some time, we've got our original device back up and running, and we want to get things back to normal. First, we will open Snapshot Replication to the Recovery tab, click Action, and then Reprotect. Reprotect allows you to sync data back to that original device. Typically, you'll want to reprotect to the original device using the data from your disaster recovery device to make sure that any changes made during the failover are sent back to the source server. After reprotecting the data, Snapshot Replication will automatically complete a switchover returning the devices to their original status as source and destination servers. Active Backup for Business and Snapshot Replication work together to create a seamless backup and disaster recovery plan. This software is valuable for organizations from small businesses with only a couple of locations to global enterprises with locations across the globe. To recap, Investor Tools purchased a DS1019 Plus to use in a trial run so they could test DSM. The IT team was able to create shared links so that the end user team could easily download files as needed. The IT team also tested our virtual machine manager by running some light VMs and they were pleased with the functionality. In their next phase, Investor Tools utilized our virtual machine manager in production at each location allowing for secondary domain controllers to exist directly on the NAS. There were also VMs in both vSphere as well as Hyper-V and physical workstations that were all able to be backed up using Active Backup for Business. Investor Tools also chose an FS6400 for their data center and they were able to multitask and centralize backups of VMs and cloud resources using the Active Backup suite. Simultaneously, this same device runs as a storage node in their virtualization infrastructure, serving the host's high-speed storage for the VMs. Lastly, with Snapshot Replication, this allows them to replicate the active backup data and optionally LUN data to the external NAS in Colorado and Illinois, providing added layers of redundancy. 
Should anything happen with the connection to the remote site, the snapshots can be failed over to the other two offices and spun up on additional resources like Hyper-V or VMware. If another host wasn't available, Virtual Machine Manager's integration with Active Backup for Business allows you to spin up your backup images directly on the NAS. I want to note that this is a very basic way to snapshot your data. You can do more advanced things like extended replication, one-to-many, and active-active replication as well. So, once again, the software that Investor Tools used were our Virtual Machine Manager, our entire Active Backup Suite, Snapshot Replication, and SAN Manager. I want to end on a quote from the IT Infrastructure Admin at Investor Tools. He said, Synology has saved us incredible amounts of time and money. They enabled us to reduce server hardware expenditure and cancel our cloud backup subscriptions, all while making infrastructure and workstation backups, system logging, and file management much easier. And once again, this is our goal, for you to have an easy and cost-effective way to store, manage, and backup your data. Today, we've talked about two customer stories, but you can read about what other businesses are doing with our devices on our website at Synology.com. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the second half of the Synology Virtual Workshops for 2022. My name's Cody. I'm a Senior Technical Account Manager here at Synology, and I'm going to be your guide for the second half here today. Today, I have the awesome privilege to actually showcase to all of you the new and improved Synology C2 ecosystem, which now has a ton of new features and services that are available to it, and we're going to explore all that here today together. Before we begin on any of that, let's start off with some Synology C2 history. Synology C2 originally began as a backup destination for your hyper backup tasks. This meant that you were able to actually send data on your Synology NAS in your shared folders, your application config data, and even your DSM config data directly up to this cloud destination. This data center was originally located in Frankfurt, Germany, and this tight integration and initial support with Hyper Backup meant Synology users had an easy way to backup all this data to a trusted cl cloud provider, and you're able to easily restore from anywhere at any time. This gave Synology users more functionality than backing up to a more general third-party public cloud provider. Now, Synology C2 today uh, is currently evolving. We now have more than one data center. We have one in Taiwan, in the US, near the Seattle area, and also we still have that Frankfurt, Germany location. Also with Synology C2, it was originally designed with security at top of mind. That means that there's two-factor authentication and C2 encryption for your logins. But security doesn't just end there with Synology C2. There's also multiple layers of encryption, with client-side encryption being an option in your hyper backup tasks, and options for encryption at rest and end-to-end -end encryption that we're going to see in some of these other C2 services. We also focused on data redundancy in the cloud. That means there's multiple copies of your data at whatever data center you're subscribed to, so you can always restore your data with ease anywhere at any time. Lastly, certification and compliance was also a big focus with Synology C2, with us having support for ISO 27001 certification and SOC 2 for our German and US data centers, respectively. We also are compliant with HIPAA as well as GDPR for our European users. Now, Synology C2 today is no longer just a backup destination uh, for your hyper backup tasks. The functionality is still there, but now Synology C2 storage can be partitioned off to be either used as a backup destination for hyper backup tasks or as a hybrid share folder that you can utilize with that hybrid share service that is now built into Synology's DSM-7. Now simply put, Synology C2 and its surrounding services exist for those who may want to expand their functionality past what their current equipment, infrastructure, or expertise currently allow. With this C2 expansion, even those without a Synology NAS can benefit from accessing the greater Synology ecosystem. And for those that do have a Synology NAS, some previous technical limitations are actually being shed. Because of this, using Synology C2 and the on-premise NAS together is most desirable, and in many cases, best practice depending on your organization's goals. So let's get started by looking at the Synology C2 services, starting with Synology C2 storage, of course. Beginning with Synology C2 storage, this is the solution that brings key functionality to your storage infrastructure to make a truly hybrid environment. And it helps you to merge the powers of your on-premise storage with all the benefits that you get from using a public cloud like Synology C2. Now, by having an on-premise NAS and using Synology C2 storage as a destination, you gain access to one of the cornerstones of our business continuity and disaster recovery suite. 
by using C2 as a disaster recovery location and as a hyper backup destination, you can create additional copies of your critical data like your backup data and place them into a secure cloud for safekeeping. Now you get a lot of great functionality with using hyper backup to C2 like multi-versioning, deduplication, granular store, and even desktop utilities to help you do restores if you ever need them. With multi-versioning, you can retain as many versions as your storage can actually hold and if you need additional storage, you can easily adjust your subscription in Synology C2 storage on the fly. With deduplication, what's great about this solution is it helps to reduce your storage footprint in the cloud. What's also great about it is you're only charged with your storage in Synology C2 storage after that deduplication takes place, so you can reap the benefits of that. With your granular restore options, you have the ability to restore entire backups or individual files and folders with ease from anywhere, and you can even use your desktop utilities to do so. These are the reasons why you want to use Synology C2 as your backup destination for your hyper backup tasks. Now in Synology C2 Hybrid Share, you get all that great functionality you receive whenever you utilize a public cloud like Synology C2, and you're able to bring it down into your everyday workflow with your on-premise file server, which is your Synology NAS in this case. Now with Hybrid Share, you gain direct access to a C2 data lake in the cloud in Synology C2 storage, and your on-premise NAS in this case is going to serve as a local cache. What's great about this local cache is you're actually able to access that data over your local network speeds and use normal file protocols like SMB. On top of that, this relationship between the on-premise NAS as the local cache and hybrid share is end-to-end -end encrypted. So before your data ever leaves the NAS or vice versa, it is taken care of so you can rest assured that your data is protected. Now with Synology C2 hybrid share, it's a very flexible solution. On one hand, you can use it for expansion. Let's say you have a smaller 16 terabyte device you could mount a hybrid share folder for a larger data lake in Synology C2 storage. And what that means is now that smaller capacity NAS has access to a potentially much larger pool of data, maybe even larger than what that NAS can actually handle in a single chassis. Now with Synology C2 hybrid share, you can also create a cross-site sync for your multiple offices all the way around the globe. What that means is that when the devices actually need data synced to them, they're talking directly with the data center C2 hybrid share so you can reap the benefits of all the bandwidth uh, that that data center has available to it. So let's diagram out this scenario. In the first stage here, we're gonna start off with a single node hybrid share environment, and then we're gonna take it a step further uh, down the line in just a moment. Now in this scenario, we have an on-site NAS that is going to be your local file server, and it's running DSM-7 and that hybrid share service. So let's say it has 50 terabytes in its local cache, and it's communicating directly with a C2 storage subscription and a hybrid share folder that has 200 terabytes available to it. Now your local cache is of course gonna be populated with some data that you access frequently, and you'll be able to access that data over normal protocols like SMB. Now if you needed additional data for your local cache, that can be requested on demand from your hybrid share folder in C2 storage, and it'll be streamed down directly from the data center. Now if your hybrid share local cache was actually full, then when you request additional data, it'll actually swap out older and least used data, making room for that data that was just requested. Now let's take things a step further and do a multi-node diagram here. As you can see, you can have almost any shape and size of Synology NAS mounted to your hybrid share folder. And in this case, we have three different locations and each of them are running hybrid share. And they're all mounted back to that same hybrid share folder. What's great about these local cache solutions for each of these locations is they each can have their own unique amount of data. And whenever they request additional data from the hybrid share folder in C2 storage, it is delivered to them directly by the data center. So you can reap the benefits of the bandwidth and performance that is available to Synology C2. Now in using Synology C2 hybrid share, you get to merge the benefits of a public cloud solution like Synology C2 with the performance you get on your on-premise resources, mixing your cloud reliability, scalability, accessibility with your LAN performance, offline access, and data redundancy. But what's great about Synology C2 Hybrid Share is you still get to retain privacy with your data due to end-to-end -end encryption, making sure that your data is protected before it ever leaves either one of those locations. So as you can see, we're actually in our dashboard for our C2 storage environment, and this is a nice easy breakdown of how your storage is being utilized. On one hand, you can see we have around 250 gigabytes for hyper backup, and we have partitioned off around 600 gigabytes for hybrid share, and in our total subscription, we have one terabytes of available space. Uh, that's what we're actually subscribed to. If we go to our hybrid share tab here, you can see how much data is being partitioned off for the hybrid share service. If we look into our hybrid share folder labeled hybrid here, you can see we have two different Synology NAS already paired back to it. 
Now, if we click edit, this is gonna be what allows you to expand or reduce your hybrid share folder quota inside of your C2 storage subscription. So you can increase its overall footprint utilizing this edit button here. Now, in our case, we have around 600 gigabytes utilized currently in hybrid share, but we have around 400 gigabytes that we could utilize to expand hybrid share in the future if we wanted to increase that footprint inside of C2 storage. Now, this whole backend portal shows you just how transparent your C2 storage subscription is, and this portal gives you complete control over the storage space utilized inside of C2 storage. As you can see, we're on our Synology NAS, so let's go ahead and mount that hybrid folder that we showed in the C2 storage dashboard. To do so, we're gonna go to Control Panel, go to Shared Folder, hit Create, and mount the hybrid share folder. While walking through this wizard, you're going to be prompted to log into your C2 storage subscription. In our case, that's already been done. So we're just going to grant access to our Synology C2 storage subscription by clicking this Allow button right here. Now, once we click through the rest of this wizard, we're now going to be able to select what folder we want to mount to. If you don't have a hybrid share folder created yet in C2 storage, you can do so with the Create button. But we're going to mount that hybrid folder we just showed you in the C2 storage dashboard. Now, moving through here, we're going to need to, of course, type in our encryption key to gain access to the hybrid share data. Now, on the next screen, you're going to be able to choose where you actually want this hybrid share folder to live and also set up your local cache for that hybrid share folder. In our case, it's going to be 500 gigabytes. Now, once you have this wizard complete, it'll initialize the hybrid share folder and that local cache on your Synology NAS. Once that's all complete, the relationship between your C2 storage account and your local hybrid share local cache is going to be complete. So now we can begin to interact with the data inside of that hybrid share folder utilizing just normal local file protocols or file station. Now if we go over to file station right now and navigate to our hybrid folder, you can see we have a list of different data right here and you'll notice that there's a status icon to the right of it. That says right now with that cloud icon that that file is currently being stored on Synology C2 storage. Now, if we click on that file, we're going to be able to view it almost immediately as it's being streamed down on demand from Synology C2 storage. Now, once it doesn't have that cloud icon there and it has a check mark in the status icon, what that means is it's now stored on that Synology NAS and available locally regardless of your internet connection. So you can see we have a couple different uh, pieces of data, those couple photos right there now stored on the Synology NAS. You can also do things like pinning data permanently, so even if your hybrid share is full and some swaps might occur, you will always have that data that you pinned permanently right there. So in this next screen, what we're doing is we're navigating via SMB to that hybrid share folder as a normal end user would. So now you can just easily click and drag through Windows Files Explorer new data into that hybrid share folder over normal file protocols. What's great about this whole solution right here is that even though it's an advanced next generation file server with a hybrid cloud environment for your end user, they still interact with their file server as they always have through map drive, SMB, etc. So the learning curve for your end users is incredibly small, even though it is again an advanced file serving option. Now in our final demo for HyperShare today, what you're going to see is we have one Synology NAS on the left that has a pretty much maxed out local cache at around 500 gigabytes, and we have another Synology NAS also mounted to that same HyperShare folder, and it doesn't have that same amount of local data in their local cache. Now even though the first NAS is nearly full on its hybrid share folder on its local cache, we can still upload additional data into that folder. Now, as we upload this data, you're going to notice it's going to start swapping out old data. And at certain points, it's actually going to decrease its total local cache capacity as it makes room for that data you're uploading over local protocols, for example. Now, once that whole upload is complete on the fuller hybrid share on the left for demo server one, what you'll notice is after that upload queue is finished, for the hybrid share folder to C2, you now have full access to that data on the second NAS. You can stream that data down on demand directly from C2. And in this case, what is really fantastic about this solution is that whenever your different devices are interacting with this hybrid share data and they request new data, it's automatically served out from the data center. So you get to reap the benefits of the bandwidth that is available to that data center when you request this new data. Now, in terms of hybrid share deployments, there are a lot of options. We just saw the data lake option. That's really just organizational data in the cloud and your offices get on-premise local access. But you can also use hybrid share as an expansion option. Let's say you have a smaller NAS, it's getting a little bit full and it can't house any more drive bays or expansions. So you can actually mount a hybrid share folder on that NAS 
and give it potentially access to a larger pool of data inside of your C2 hybrid share folder. The last portion here is using C2 hybrid share as a way to meet uh, compliance guidelines for having offsite data because your C2 hybrid share environment actually holds a copy of that data and your local cache data can be versioned by using Synology Drive. Now let's go ahead and diagram out the expansion scenario for a hybrid share solution. So let's say, once again, we have a smaller capacity NAS and it has around 50 terabytes available to it in a local cache and it's connected to a C2 storage subscription that has a hybrid share folder with 200 terabytes uh, partitioned for it right now. So in that 50 terabyte local cache, of course, you have data populated. Your users are actually interacting with that data over local protocols uh, or normal file protocols like SMD and you're able to request new data on demand and swap out old data if that local cache is full. Now let's say this organization has uh, some extra budget now and they're looking to expand their footprint of their local cache in their storage network. So when they get that new Synology NAS installed, they're gonna be able to mount that hybrid share folder and begin pinning data locally to uh, then always have it accessible through that local cache. Let's say they wanna pin around 100 terabytes. Now, once they do that, what they can do is then go into their hybrid share folder in their C2 storage subscription and lessen the amount of storage that's partitioned for it. And they can use that excess space for additional hyper backup tasks on that NAS. Now, we just spoke about hybrid share and how you can use that tool to create your own hybrid cloud environment. Now, we should begin to introduce some other C2 services alongside that. Another solution of those services that actually fits really nicely into a hybrid cloud environment is C2 Identity which is a all-in-one identity management platform that lets you centrally manage users, groups, and single sign-on for SaaS applications, both cross-site and cross-organization. Now, C2 Identity is a cross-platform solution. It supports DSM, the operating system on the NAS, Windows, and macOS environments. Now, because it supports things like DSM, which function as edge LDAP nodes in this environment, you can do things like offline authentication. So even if you lose a uh, connection to the internet, you can still do offline authentication with that Edge LDAP node, that on-premise Synology NAS. Now from the get-go, C2 Identity already integrates with some major cloud platforms like Microsoft 365 and Google Workspace. So you can create a single sign-on environment for those SaaS platforms. It's also a highly scalable solution. It supports up to 25 on-site LDAP nodes. And again, those are the Synology NAS functioning as those Edge LDAP nodes on your on-premise locations, you know, either nationwide or around the world. As you can see, we're in our C2 identity instance inside of our greater Synology C2 ecosystem. And we already have a list of users inside of our environment. Now you can add in a user manually with the add button on the top right and you'll enter in the relevant information for that user there. If you click show more, you'll be able to add in additional details for that user if your organization requires it. Now, if you wanted to move from a previous platform, let's say LDAP or Microsoft's Active Directory, you can do so under add for import users and groups. And you can select one of those sources there. If you were to select Active Directory, for example, you'd be prompted for the necessary details to complete that whole import process. For us, in our case, the import procedure that we followed is we actually utilized importing via CSV. So that's how you see the 20-some-odd users inside of our C2 identity environment. Now, not just actually adding in users on a one-by-one -one basis and managing them that way, you can also manage users at the group level. And you can apply groups inside of C2 identity under this group menu. Now, there's already a default group for everyone, but let's add a new one in in our case. This group, let's go ahead and name it Workshop, and you can apply a description for that if you wanted to keep things organized. Now, on the next page, you're going to select what users you want applied to this specific group, and that's pretty much it for the whole group creation process. Now, what we're going to do is actually drill down inside of the group, and you'll notice that there's other modules here for devices and application. This is where you grant permissions for the users inside of your group to log into your managed devices like endpoint PCs or even software as a service platforms like Microsoft 365. To add in managed devices, under Manage Device, you can click the Add button on the top right to then download the agent that you'll install on your endpoint PCs for Windows or Mac OS devices. Make sure you grab your connect key and enter it when prompted to finish that whole integration. Now, any users that'll actually have permissions to these different devices can log into them through the agent with their C2 identity credentials. Now, under Edge Server, this is where you actually add in your Edge LDAP server nodes here. In this case, it's gonna be Synology NAS devices. Now, if you actually go and click the Add button on the top right, you'll be prompted on how to actually get that installed on Synology NAS, basically installing the C2 identity Edge Server through Pact Center on the NAS and also applying your connect key when prompted there. 
Now, the last portion of this whole equation is getting integration with your software as a service platforms. In our case, Microsoft 365. So if we head over to the application menu, what you're going to notice is we are already integrated with our environment. And if we take a look at the privileges menu right at the top, you'll notice that we have our whole list of users and they're actually synced and paired back to their Microsoft 365 users. So if we hover over my user, for example, and go to that link button, you'll notice my C2 identity credentials are now synced with that app account in Microsoft 365. Now, what's great about this whole solution is now anytime one of your C2 identity users has permissions to your managed devices, your Edge LDAP servers, or even your Microsoft 365 instance in this case, they can use their C2 identity credentials to log in with them. So what you're going to notice is we're logging into our Windows environment here. We're logging in through our C2 identity agent and using our C2 identity credentials, and you see that login was successful. Likewise, if we open up our Synology NAS, we can also use those same credentials to log into DSM. So what's great about this whole solution is you can create a truly single sign-on environment across your on-premise resources and your software as a service instances like Microsoft 365. So let's go ahead and introduce the rest of the Synology C2 services that are now available on the platform. We've already touched on Synology C2 storage as well as C2 identity, but there's also Synology C2 backup, transfer, and password. In terms of Synology C2 Backup, it's a backup solution that allows you to backup from anywhere directly to the cloud as long as you have an internet connection, which means you don't need to have direct access to a NAS to back up to. Now, what's great about this solution is even though it's direct cloud, you can do a full bare metal image and do full bare metal restores over the internet. And there's also options for file level download anywhere, anytime using the recovery portal. It also integrates directly with Synology C2 Identity, so both the solutions in the Synology C2 Cloud are tightly integrated and communicate with each other effectively. Now, we had a recent Synology Partner Online training, which is our monthly webinar series on this topic. So it goes into much greater depth than we can in a two-hour workshop here today. So if you want to see a greater in-depth look at C2 Backup, definitely check out that Synology Partner Online training. Uh, in the meantime, though, let's take a look and have a quick refresher on how C2 Backup works and what it can do for you. So here we are inside of C2 Backup, inside of the greater Synology C2 ecosystem. We're underneath the on-premises tab and we're underneath the personal computer tab on the left on top of that. So you'll notice we have several devices already listed and they're paired back to specific users. We'll talk about how this is integrating with C2 Identity in just a moment. Before we get started with other features inside of C2 Backup, let's do a file level download and restore as a refresher. So we're gonna select a device go over to the right three dots and click on download files and folders. Now, as this window is opening, you're gonna notice it's opening the C2 backup recovery portal. But before you gain access to your backup versions and that backup data, you're gonna to need to decrypt your data because everything inside of Synology C2 is locked down and secure. So once we decrypt this data, you're gonna be presented with a familiar file structure. It's gonna pretty much mirror your file structure that of your device on the day that this backup version was actually taken. So we're going to drill down into the C drive for this Windows device. We're going to drill down into my specific user, and you can pull files and folders out of this menu here. You can just select one of the checkboxes and click the download button on the top right to download a zip file directly to your PC. Now, as we work through everything today, everything that we talk about, the file level downloads and the bare metal restore also work for physical server devices. But if you needed to change your backup policy for your environment, you can do so under the backup policy tab. Some things that you can change for your backup policy include the backup scope, backing up your entire device or even specific volumes. You can also set up a backup trigger and schedule to back up when you lock your computer or log out at the end of the day. And you can also set up your retention rules inside of your policy. Now, if you needed to ever do a full bare metal recovery of your device over the internet directly from Synology C2 backup, you would want to go to personal computer select the three dots on one of those devices once again, and create a C2 backup bootable recovery media. You're gonna need that on hand before you actually do your recovery, so make sure you create that ahead of time. Now, the next thing that you can do inside of Synology C2 backup is actually integrate with software as a service platforms. You can integrate with Microsoft 365 to take a direct backup of your Microsoft 365 email data, which is a cloud-to-cloud -cloud backup. Now you notice under the management tab, we have some different users listed, and this is where C2 Identity actually integrates with C2 Backup. Now your C2 Backup agents will need to be logged in utilizing these UPN addresses. So now whenever your C2 Identity users log in to that C2 Backup agent, it'll be paired with the correct C2 Identity user. 
Now, what's really great about the C2 backup platform is you can back up your device from anywhere, and you can also do full bare metal recoveries from anywhere and pull individual files and folders out. So you don't need to have direct access to your NAS at all times. You can just communicate directly with the C2 backup environment. Now, with Synology C2 Transfer, it is a fully cloud-based solution that allows you to share files with anyone, anywhere with identity verification and end-to-end -end encryption. So it's a highly secure solution that allows you to share potentially sensitive materials with third parties. And it's not just a one-to-one -one transfer. You can have up to 100 concurrent transfers for the data that you upload to C2 Transfer. Now, C2 Transfer has a very specific workflow that benefits uh, the users and the admins for the C2 Transfer environment. In the first step, you can tightly control who actually receives the link to gain access and apply things like limits for downloads and watermarks for the files you distribute. These watermarks could even be text-based or they could be your company logo emblazoned as a watermark on the files that you distribute. Now, in the second step, what's great about this is there's identity verification. So you can be sure that the correct people are actually accessing that data. Now, on the access side of things, what's great about this solution is it's a one-time password for your recipients and all of those controls that you set up in step one are applied like the limits and watermarks that we just mentioned. So here we are in the C2 transfer environment. Before we gain access to the platform, we're gonna to need to decrypt our data. That's because C2 keeps all of your data secure and locked down. Now, once we've typed in our encryption key, we're gonna be able to gain access to that platform. Now, we're gonna do a file transfer in our case, but keep in mind, you can also do a file request to actually ingest data from third parties, but we're gonna actually distribute data to third parties in this case. So we're gonna go back to the file transfer menu and begin adding files into this task. So we're gonna click the upload button and the upload files option. Now we're gonna select a file or a couple of files on our local computer. We're gonna to go to the new data folder and select these four photos in our case. Now once we've got these populated in the C2 transfer, you're gonna see them on the right hand pane. We wanna then add in some different parameters to our transfer task. So we're gonna select one of the tags along the top to begin changing those. So first and foremost, we're gonna rename this task to something that's easy to manage. So we're gonna actually name it workshop in our case. And once that's done, we're gonna set our expiration for this link. We're gonna just set it to be about 24 hours, so the next day in our case. We're also gonna set up a download limit to limit one download per file and also apply a watermark. We're gonna stick with a text-based watermark, but you can also do an image-based watermark and apply your company's logo, for example. Now that we've got those parameters set, you're gonna to wanna to check and make sure you got the settings correct using the tags along the top. Now, once you've got that all verified, you can then begin adding in your recipients and the list of recipients that you want to actually receive this transfer. Now, on this next page, we're gonna type in emails, but keep in mind, they're not actually going to get an alert through their email address that they're getting a Synology CQ transfer. These lists of users, their emails or their phone numbers are just used for identity verification. You'll be creating the link that you share with them in just a second. So now we've got our user lists all populated there and we're gonna hit create link. And now this is going to be encrypting and uploading your files to the C2 transfer platform. Now that we've got that all uploaded, we can grab this link that we need to actually share with those recipients. So we can go ahead and copy that and distribute that to the third parties we actually want to transfer to. Now what's great about this whole solution and setting up your transfer in this way is you have tight controls over who is actually receiving this full transfer task and you have identity verification because you set up that recipient list. So now we're going to flip perspectives a little bit and take a look at things from the user's perspective, the recipients of this C2 transfer. Now you remember that we actually set up our recipient list and also created a C2 transfer sharing link. So this user in this case has actually utilized that link to get to this get access code menu. So what they're gonna do in this case is actually type in their email address. And what's happening here is they're actually doing identity verification. Now once they type in their email address, that's going to be when they actually can get their access code sent to their email. And that's going to be their one-time password in this case. So what we're gonna do is go ahead and type in our email, click send access code, and then check our email to see what that access code is actually going to be. So on the flip side here, we can then type in that access code as a user in this case. So we're gonna go ahead and type in the one that we just received from our email. And now you can see you get the menu of all the different files that were uploaded to this C2 transfer task. So we can then begin to download these files and it'll zip them all up for you and you can then access them on your local computer. 
So let's go ahead and open up one of these files in this case, and you can see our watermark has been applied like we set in the Synology C2 transfer task. As you remember, we set up our watermark to be text-based and have it say confidential. Now what you'll notice as we exit out of this file explorer menu is that whenever you actually download this specific file, we actually set a limit to only have one download per file. So if we look at all the different files, they're now grayed out and we have no option to actually download them again because we only got one copy in this C2 transfer task. What's great about this is all of the limits that you applied to the C2 transfer environment are also enforced whenever your users actually go and retrieve that data. So you have tight control of when and how your data is distributed to those third parties. Now with Synology C2 Password, it is a zero knowledge password manager that helps you with assisted logins for many different websites like your bank account or some other website that you wanna log into. It also supports cross-site syncing between your devices. So you have your passwords on pretty much any of the devices that you use normally. And this syncing procedure is actually end-to-end -end encrypted, so you can rest assured that the sensitive password data that's actually being moved around is taken care of. On top of that, there is a handy web browser extension that you can utilize to help with the autofill for logging into those websites. So here we are inside of our C2 password environment. You'll notice we're already logged into this portal and we've already decrypted our data in this case. Now you'll see that we have a whole list of logins already populated in our environment. If you wanted to add a new login, you can actually do so with the Add button. You also have options to import. If you're moving from another password manager into Synology C2 Transfer, we do support importing via CSV file. If we add via a category here, you'll notice that you have different category options. If we select Login, there's a specific amount of parameters that you can input for this login category, and there's some custom field options. If we select another category, like your bank account, for example, there's gonna be other parameters there that you can input, that are specific to your financial institution, like your PIN code for the account or its SWIFT code, for example. Now, another thing you'll notice is after you've actually imported those different logins or other categories, you'll notice they're actually organized on the left-hand pane underneath categories. So if you select one of those categories, it's gonna automatically filter your logins or bank accounts via that category type. You can also set custom tags for your different logins and different categories of C2 password objects, so you can organize them via if they're personal, for example, or if they're work-based logins. Now, we have this Synology account login right at the top already built into Synology C2 Password. So we're gonna use C2 Password and its browser extension to actually log into our Synology account on the main Synology website. So you'll notice we're gonna log in on our main Synology website using the sign-in button, and we're actually able to autofill this specific login utilizing our C2 Password browser extension. That's what that little shield is next to the login screen there. So what's great about Synology C2 Password is you get to keep all of your passwords in that same Synology ecosystem. And Synology C2 locks down all of your sensitive data in that cloud platform. On top of that, you get cross-site syncing so that no matter what device you're on, you have access to your whole range of login data. So we just went over the entire Synology C2 cloud platform. On the one hand, you have your on-premise NAS and all the other hybrid cloud options that you can use alongside of it, like Synology C2 Storage and the other services you use to interact with that like Hyper Backup and Hybrid Share. Now C2 Identity kind of exists in the middle of the hybrid cloud options and the public cloud options because you can use Identity alongside your Synology NAS which would function as an Edge LDAP node. Now the other solutions are C2 Backup, Password, and Transfer which are purely public cloud solutions that you interact with directly rather than moving through a NAS like with Hyper Backup. So let's step into the final portion of today's session and that is on the Synology community and the partners that are involved with that community. We recently caught up with Method Group out of the New York City area and their founder, Eddie Wong. Now, Method Group has been around since 1991 and are a well-established managed service provider in the New York City metro area. Now, managed service providers and sysadmins alike have several things at the top of their mind. One of those is, of course, the backup solutions for their customers' data. They need to be able to protect 100% of that customer data so they can help restore that data in the event of a disaster. These MSPs also need to have some sort of cloud monitoring so they have 24 by 7 insight into what is actually going on at their clients' networks. They can stay plugged in and service them the best way possible. They also need to have some sort of security service to help defend their clients against cyber threats. So with this in mind, Method Group needed to set up a robust backup option for their clients. 
To start, they rented some space out of a colleague's data center. However, it was a VMware-based data center, so Method Group was paying for some extra compute resources that wasn't really required for a backup solution. They next tried Azure and AWS on top of that, but once egress fees were applied, it really wasn't a cheaper solution and it was unnecessarily expensive to take data out. Now, with that in mind, Eddie then turned to Synology and C2 based on his good experience with the rest of the Synology ecosystem. Now, here's a great quote from Eddie whenever we just recently spoke to him. He mentioned before Synology, there was not a single day that didn't have backup problems. Years ago, I would dream of a day with no problems. Well, now, that's a normal day. So let's take a look at how Method Group takes care of all their clients with this new Synology solution. Now, Method Group has their main office and all of their different client offices out in the field across the New York City metro area. In this solution, each of those client offices have their own Synology NAS on site, and that NAS is backing up data locally and serving other functions for those clients. Now, at this same time, Method Group technicians actually stay plugged into the health of those Synology NAS on site through Synology's CMS or central management system. Simultaneously, these on-site devices at these client locations can also back up all that data they're aggregating up to Synology C2 storage, utilizing Hyper Backup. Now, in choosing the solution, Method Group and their clients can enjoy a ton of different Synology advantages. Chief among these is the ability now to save their customers a ton of money. The Synology solution has a low overall cost per terabyte, and there's no backup software subscription fees. On top of that, Method Group, with their Robinhood complex, were actually able to pass on these savings to their customers resulting in a 75% reduction in their overall backup costs. On top of that, this solution also helps to save money. As Eddie mentioned earlier, previous solutions required their technicians to address issues every single day. But with the new Synology solution, that is definitely not the case. So there's now a reduction in overall maintenance investment by Method Group. And on top of that, there's also faster recovery options available with the Synology solution, with the data that's residing in Synology C2 available immediately whenever you need it. Lastly, by having Synology NAS on site, there's now a whole suite of business continuity and disaster recovery options available to Method Group technicians and their clients. You can spin up failed devices on the Synology NAS, and when using any of this software suite, you have complete control over the hardware in this process. Let's discuss how Method Group would actually service a client now that they have this Synology backup solution in place. Now, Method Group has their main office, there's a client site, and they have an on-site Synology NAS that is still monitored by method group technicians through CMS or central management system. Let's say now that a breakage occurs on the on-site Synology NAS for that client. Someone kicked the NAS or spilled some water on it. Now, CMS would alert method group technicians back at their HQ, and they would confirm with the client. Once confirmed that there was a breakage on that Synology NAS, method group technicians would physically drive out a new chassis. All they need to do at that point is remove the drives from the damaged unit, insert them into the new device, and fire it right up. Typically, they can have the organization back up and running in about 30 minutes, and most of that time is actually just physically transporting the device over to the client site, and the actual reinstall of the drives is only a couple minutes, and the boot process is just another couple minutes after that. As this illustrates, redundancy for on-site backup servers may not be critical for overall uptime for all businesses, and swapping a chassis like this works well for Method Group. However, we also asked Eddie what Method Group's strategy would be for placing a Synology NAS as a business file server in a production environment. In these cases, Method Group chooses to implement one or more of our business continuity solutions. Some of the options that are available to Synology users are things like Synology High Availability, which involves getting two identical NAS together, connecting them via an external heartbeat connection to allow them to sync together. Now, if one of the nodes goes down in this relationship, in this Synology High Availability environment, you can fail over between those two different nodes. We also have dual controller options for active passive or load balancing dual active solutions. And you can use offsite failover functionality in the snapshot replication package, which allows you to bring an extra copy of your data live at a secondary location to help keep your business running. That was our conversation with Method Group. They are a wonderful Synology partner and a well-established managed service provider serving the New York City metro area. If you're around that area, go ahead and reach out to sales at methodgroup.com. They can definitely help ease some IT pain points that might be present in your organization. And thanks once again to Eddie for sharing your experiences with the audience. So what does it mean to pair up with a Synology partner? Whenever you work with a Synology partner, you can rest assured that you are dealing with a trained Synology professional. They receive this consistent training from their dedicated account managers, which are tightly integrated Synology resources for those organizations. They typically speak with our partners on a day-to-day -day or a week-to-week -week basis. 
Also, our partners are active contributors to the Synology uh, feature stack. And partners' feedback is actually one of the core things that guides our product development. Now, if you want to be a part of our feature stack and our product development in the future, go ahead and visit Synology.com and click on our Contact Us page. Or you can call your account manager and inform them. Now, Eddie Wong dreamed of a day when there were no backup problems, and Synology helped make that dream a reality. So go ahead and reach out to us. We want to hear about what you dream about, and hopefully we can build that into DSM in the future. So let's go ahead and summarize what we just went over and plan our next engagements together. Now, in summary, in the first half with Dave, we went over some DSM customer stories, which were real-world examples of real Synology users and how they use a variety of different Synology solutions to meet their organization's goals. Now, in the next half with me, we actually went over the C2 hybrid cloud and some different features inside of that ecosystem, like C2 storage using hyper backup and hybrid share and the other services that are now available on that platform. We rounded things out by talking to our Synology community member, Method Group, and Eddie Wong to hear their side of things and their successes with Synology. Now, we went over a ton of different packages today, and we have another webinar platform called Synology Partner Online Training. So if you need more information on any of these packages, Synology Partner Online Training is our most comprehensive step-by-step -step training library with dozens of hours of detailed training and it contains exponentially more information than we could possibly show you on a two-hour workshop. So definitely check out those Synology Partner Online Trainings. Now, if you need additional help past what this workshop covered or past what the Synology Partner Online Training Library provides, then go ahead and reach out to one of our authorized partners on our Where to Buy page. This is a list of service providers in your area, and they'd be a great resource to reach out to if you need any additional assistance. Keep in mind, that list is not exhaustive of our entire partner network, so if you don't see someone in your area, go ahead and reach out to us and we can provide an introduction. Also, if you're a business end user with your own internal IT team, we have a business onboarding team to help your organization out. We can provide project consultations and training on Synology software, and if you need an introduction to an integrator, for example, we can get that introduction taken care of for you. Lastly, if you have a very specific question, we do have an online inquiry form. Go ahead and fill it out, and our highly trained inquiry team will be able to get your question answered. So that about wraps up the Synology Virtual Workshops for 2022. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in to this two-hour event, and thank you to the Synology community for all of your efforts in driving our feature stack. It's truly all of the Synology users out there that drive all these great features that we're releasing year in and year out. So thank you for that. And with that said, thanks again for tuning in. We'll see you all next time. Take care.